Chapter 1. To get started in training for a paddleboard competition, find a coach. There are many of us who love being near or around water, which is why houses built on lakes or near the ocean are generally high in demand. But for those who don't have access to a motorboat, jet ski, or consistent ocean waves to surf on, getting out on the water to use it as exercise can be challenging. Fortunately, paddleboarding offers a way for people who enjoy being on the water an easy, affordable means to do so without needing a boat ramp special boating license or motor appealing to watermen and women around the world paddle boarding offers a way to stay in shape get out on the water and enjoy the natural environment around you using your own strength to glide around in bodies of pure liquid form paddle boarding can be directly correlated to greatly enhancing mind body and spirit but while many people enjoy recreational paddling, touring, camping, and exploring, there are few active, elite athletes that want to take their love of the water and exercise to the next level. Training and then competing in a paddleboard race forces one to set tangible goals and learn about the process and what it takes to succeed. Therefore, you want to dedicate the time it takes to train for your first competition and work with someone who knows what they're doing. There are dozens of resources and groups online that offer training tips, but most of them will tell you that whatever training plan you go with is tailored to the individual. Since we are all unique in our own body types, lifestyle choices, diet, nutrition, and dealing with past injuries or experiences, it's important to find a coach who understands your needs, goals, and is available to encourage you all the way up to your first race and beyond. Of course, hiring a trainer isn't a requirement to enter your first paddleboard competition. It can just help a lot. An experienced paddleboarder understands what it takes to excel in a competition and can point out what you're doing right or wrong. Those with more race entries under their belt have much more insight they can give you. They've been through it all. Someone guiding you in your quest to help you into a paddleboard competition can steer you on the right track regarding your form, technique, and mindset. Having a motivational coach will get you ready to enter a paddleboard competition safely and help you want to stick with the sport. We all have the same philosophy about entering a paddleboard race. Set a goal. Ask someone who knows about paddleboarding about it. Tell them where you're at and where you need to be. Instead of asking what is the process, think about who you're going to do it with says Mike Wing of Mike's Paddle Shop in Alameda, California. When looking for the right trainer, try to find out what their success rate is in clients who've reached their goals. In his own business, Mike involves himself with the community by spending a lot of time and commitment into supporting his team. Meeting at least twice a month, the team learns from each other to progress and supplements it with additional workshops and other gatherings. He says there are many ways people enter competitions, and there are many individuals who just go from race to race by themselves and do it on their own. But he wants to create an environment where the team practices together, enter races together, and continuously motivates each other. With a team, you have people giving consistent help, encouraging you, and it's nice to be around people who are as passionate about paddleboarding as you are. Those without access to a team can go with a personal coach, Mike says. He personally trains paddleboarders from all over the country to prepare for their races. He trained a woman to prepare for a Lake Tahoe circumnavigation and was currently in the process of helping a woman in Florida prepare for a 32-mile race to be held in Tennessee. For the Lake Tahoe Circumnavigation Challenge, Mike worked with a woman from January through September a full nine months. A personal coach is more involved and can help keep you on track. 90% of it is getting a person to a racing state and the psychology behind it, Mike says. If you are a mom juggling a busy household or changing jobs, how are you going to make the time for this? Training for a paddleboard competition is challenging. You change all aspects of your life. So it's probably good to take some time for self-reflection and think about whether you're ready for it, he adds.
Trainers or coaches for other types of sports say this as well. Finding the time to commit to training and sticking with it, whether it's for a paddleboard race, snow ski racing, or golfing, is the hardest thing when jumping into a new sport. Even in my own training, I felt like I got derailed by the weather leading up to Mike's Sunday fun race. During one week, a storm rolled into Lake Tahoe, and it snowed right in the middle of my training. I didn't go out on the water, but that's no excuse as I saw that Jay still went out and trained in his out trigger in freezing cold water. In my personal training, Mike did a quick assessment of me. He thought I was relatively fit and motivated, said it helped that I had experience being around the water. I've been wakeboarding for 20 years and that it helped that I was situated at a school with top racers, Waterman's Landing. When developing a training program with a new paddleboarder, Mike says in the first three weeks, he will ask his client to text him every day, morning, day, and night with what they ate that day. If they can develop a routine of doing that, no judgment passed on what's consumed, then it shows they have the commitment to reach their goals. If they don't do the simple habit of texting me, then they may not be disciplined enough to continue with a training program, Mike says. But once they pass the test of texting Mike every day in those first three weeks, then they go over their schedule leading up to the race and how much time they have to dedicate to the water factoring in vacations, important dates, etc., A lot of people want to do their own training, but they don't have good direction. There are so many guides and training videos online that it's easy to get confused, Mike says. People get into paddleboarding because it's a low-impact sport that allows you to stay in shape with a full-body workout. However, if you develop bad habits that you're practicing long-term, it can actually lead to new or different kinds of injuries. There's a high chance of injury when you don't paddle correctly. If someone is out there paddling with a five-pound aluminum paddle, they may develop shoulder, wrist, and elbow injuries, he says. Although the amount of time it takes to train for a competition is very individual, Mike suggests giving yourself at least eight weeks to properly prepare for a race, especially if you don't have a personal coach. It's easy to develop bad habits. It's very individual to each person on their training. There's a lot of information out there, and you got to pick and choose. The challenge is in having some direction, he says. I will be the first to admit that I didn't train for my first paddleboard competition the right way. I only had a month to train for a paddleboard competition that didn't even happen. There weren't enough signups for the Sacramento Fall Classic at Folsom Lake, but more on that later. And then my paddleboarding season ended as temperatures started to drop and we went into winter. I didn't have a coach. Instead, relying on tips from fellow paddlers and took this challenge on by dedicating a certain amount of time on and off the water to exercise, train, and work on my own strength and endurance to adequately prepare for my first race. However, I wish I had a coach or an athletic trainer who could encourage me and guide me along the way or a team that could be motivating me. In my first week of training, I had no idea how far I was paddling or if my technique was right. And the last thing I wanted was to develop bad habits and poor form that could lead to new injuries. But I really wanted to fully immerse myself in paddleboarding and find out if racing was right for me. And this provided an opportunity to better explore the paddleboarding racing world. I can honestly say the entire experience of training for a paddleboard competition has been enlightening and enjoyable. And I look forward to continuing my training. I didn't only lose weight and feel better overall, but being out on the water allowed me to look within myself, be in the present, and truly notice the beauty of nature and my surroundings. At times, paddleboarding helped me deal with grief, stress, and writer's block, and I even got to the point of dreaming about it. Entering a paddleboarding competition is very individual to each person on what their physique current activity level, motivation, 
commitment, and ultimate goals are. For this reason, I encourage you to visit paddleboard shops, take a lesson or two, and get involved in the paddleboarding community. Hopefully, after you put yourself out there, you will have the opportunity to build a relationship with someone who you know and trust to help you take your paddling ability to the next level. While in the process of finding a trainer, hopefully this book serves as a basic guide of how to prepare for your first short-distance paddleboard race. The advice offered here is not set in stone, and it should be taken as recommendations only based on a few paddleboarders' opinions. Enjoy! First and foremost, make sure you have access to water. Paddleboarding works best if you're close to an ocean, lake, or river that you can practice in. And no matter where you're at, it offers a full body workout for those that already love the water. Paddleboarding has been around for a long time, as it's how many Polynesian and Hawaiian warriors and surfers traveled from island to island and other land masses. However, paddleboarding experienced a revival when big wave professional surfers like Laird Hamilton started relying on paddleboarding more as a way to get an ocean workout when there weren't any waves. In 2013, Laird wrote an article for Men's Journal titled, Why I Love Paddleboarding, about his transitions from surfing to paddleboarding and how they coincide in his training. He said in the article that when his oldest daughter turned five, he took her out into the ocean on a 12-foot board that was big enough for both of them as a safe way to introduce her to the water. He soon realized that he liked paddleboarding even by himself because it gave him a completely different perspective of the ocean than what he experienced battling waves in regular surfing. Spending more than 35 years surfing all sorts of various size breaks all over the world, Laird definitely knew that sometimes there were no waves. At times, he wanted to exercise in the ocean. Laird says that paddleboarding gave him the opportunity to switch things up and keep his life interesting by approaching water in a new way. Equating paddleboarding to walking on water from a stand-up paddleboard viewpoint, he was able to see the coastline, sea life, and expanse of the horizon. As water sports continued to evolve, water babies and athletes everywhere soon realized that they could get their fix out on a paddleboard in any kind of currents. People started taking their longboard surfboards out in nearby waterways, finding that paddling around in a lake can sometimes be more scenic and challenging as it is being in an ocean or river. I love to try to surf, but I just live too far away from the ocean to be able to do it consistently. Growing up by the water, I often went swimming in the Sacramento River and wakeboarding in Shasta Lake. Being in the water was an absolute necessity on these hot 106-degree Fahrenheit days. Going into my adult life, I found that I was happiest when I lived close to the water, which is how I ended up on Lake Tahoe. Now, living about a mile from Waterman's Landing on Lake Tahoe's North Shore, I often ride my cruiser bike down to the water and take a paddleboard out on the place that was rated the number one lake that Isle Paddleboard customers like to paddle on the most. But if you have the drive, you can pretty much paddle on anything. Understanding the basics of paddleboarding. Paddleboarding is a great way to enjoy the outdoors while getting a full body workout. So it generally appeals to anyone who has an athletic inclination. There are generally two different types of paddleboards available on the market. Prone paddleboards, where you sit or lie down on a longboard and use your arms and hands as paddles to propel yourself forward. Stand-up paddleboards, commonly referred to as SUPs. These are paddleboards that you stand up on and use an actual paddle to navigate. Stand-up paddleboards are more popular and easier to find in destination places. Plus, you are able to see a lot more going on around you due to being higher up above the water. Many paddleboard competitions offer different divisions that include prone, SUP, out trigger and kayak races basically anything that requires some sort of paddling to move around on the water 
Prone paddle boards are distinguishable by their softer, rounder hulls. Since you are kneeling or lying on the board, the padding on the top is usually made of soft foam that is easier on your knees for traveling several miles. A round, skinny hull on a prone makes it almost impossible to stand up on, which is why you have to have an interest in using a paddle to go the distance you probably want to go with a sup. Please keep in mind that since stand-up paddle boarding is the more common and popular sport at the time of this printing and the activity that I have been participating in, this guide is specific to training for a sup race. Stand-up paddle boards and even prone boards are generally longer and wider than a regular surfboard to offer more stability in the water. Since you are trying to balance on top of an unstable platform, sometimes in rough conditions, you are continuously engaging the stabilizing muscles in your legs, feet, and lower body while using your arms to paddle engages your upper body strength. Even by just standing on a board, you are subliminally, actively engaging your core. American Council on Exercise Chief Science Officer Dr. Cedric Bryant says that the top three fitness regimens to get into shape are ones that utilize core strength, balance, and endurance. And fortunately, paddleboarding provides all of that. When first starting out on a stand-up paddleboard, you'll need a board, a paddle, and a life jacket. To make sure your paddle is the right length, place it on the ground with the handle facing up and extend your arm overhead. Rest your hand on top of the grip and make sure you have a slight bend in your elbow. When you paddle, you want one hand on top of the grip and the other hand in the middle of the shaft. Some paddle boarders have speculated that there is no one-size-fits-all on paddle length. Instead of depending on only your arm length and height to size up a paddle, take into consideration your flexibility, paddling technique, size of your board, and any previous injuries that cause physical limitations. Even if you've never had any major injuries, it may be better to err on the side of having a paddle that's too short rather than too long so that you don't risk overextending your reach and possibly causing a new injury. Laird Hamilton once stated that using a shorter paddle leads to increasing your stroke rate. Therefore, your paddle length can be directly attributed to cutting through the water quicker. As you launch your board out into the water, nose first, I find that it's easiest to kneel on the board while gently paddling safely away from shore. If it's windy and there are waves, I paddle straight into them. As you become more advanced, you may get to the point of being able to do a dock start or just run and jump into a standing position on the board, but I'm not quite there yet. Once I feel like I have balance, I stand up in the middle of the board. Some boards have a handle or slit in the middle to carry it, which I like to use as a starting point. Then I start to paddle in fast, easy strokes, a few on one side, then switching hands and paddling on the other side to keep on a straight path. When training for a race, I make sure that as I'm paddling, the blade is forward facing, usually the logo is faced out, and that the blade is fully immersed to better scoop and propel forward. Finding the right stand-up paddleboard for your competition. There is a wide variety of SUPs on the market depending on what your purpose for use is. Boards are constructed to accommodate those who want to catch some waves, enjoy yoga, go fishing, camping, or training for a race. In considering the types of activities that people enjoy on the water, paddleboard construction is created to concentrate on features such as hull type, easy to transport inflatable boards versus solid ones, volume and weight capacity, thickness, length, width, fins, and extra accessories. Inflatable panel boards are easier to transport and store because they don't take up a lot of space when deflated. Made with an air core and PVC exterior, inflatable boards come with an air pump and are ideal when hiking to a lake, traveling on an airplane, or if you don't have much space to store it. Since inflatable boards are softer than a solid version, they can handle white water conditions and have a 
bit of give while practicing sup yoga poses. However, when training for a race, a lot of people will go with a solid board because it tends to be faster and more stable. The construction of a solid paddle board usually involves foam core wrapped in layers of fiberglass and some carbon fiber and plastic. While it may be heavier and more rigid, it can cut through waves easier and sits lower in the water, causing less drag and more stability. When choosing a board to race on, consider the hull type and how that will affect your performance. There are two main kinds of paddleboard hulls, the planning hull and the displacement hull. A planning hull is a board shaped much like a surfboard which easily glides on top of the water and is quick to maneuver. Planning hull paddle boards are wide and flat making them an ideal choice for yoga, fishing, downwinding, or recreational paddle boarding. However, a displacement hull paddle board is more suited for racing because its pointed bow, nose, helps slice through the water. As you paddle through, water disperses to either side to create a smooth and efficient ride. Although less maneuverable than a planning hauled board, a displacement hull allows you to carve through easier and at faster speeds. When racing in calm or flat water, it's best to go with a longer, sleeker board between 12 and 14 feet in length over a shorter, wider board that's better for riding waves. Fins also make a difference as they help you track and maintain stability. Without fins, you would be bouncing around everywhere and wouldn't be able to steer or go in a certain direction. Some people like total traction with three fins under the tail, but I like having one solid long fin because I feel the board is easier to maneuver. Personally, I trained for my first race using a NSP Elements Flatwater 12 feet 6 inch paddleboard designed by NSP's race team. The Elements Flatwater is perfect for recreational use and short distance touring. The NSP Elements Flatwater usually comes with a 9 foot long tracking fin as well. Talk to other paddleboarders. Going into paddleboard shops, talking to coaches, taking a lesson, and seeing what other competitors are riding out there in the water will help you decide what works best for you. At times, when I was out training on the lake, I saw people who were cruising so fast that it was obvious they were a racer. I took some time to study their form, stroke technique, and what type of equipment they were using. The faster competitors always seem to be on skinnier performance boards with pointed noses displacement hull construction. When training for your first paddleboard competition, it helps to try out a few different types of boards to learn the ins and outs of them. It's also good to join a fitness class, clinic, or take a lesson from a pro. Going to races and talking to other competitors Editors and learning about their training experiences may also help you tailor your own training program.